fuel for uh, thinking through some of these groups. And then we don't have to worry about our fifth um, research abstract until finals week. So we don't have to worry about it this week or next week. We'll take care of it during finals week. And again, our final, it's going to be on Canvas, uh, but we have to meet during our scheduled final time. And so the plan is right now to do a potluck. So you can bring some parasite themed dessert or entree, whatever you want. Whatever you want, we can make it happen. All right. So we, um, well, I'm going to pray for us and then we'll start talking about uh, insect parasites. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to continue to explore these strange and intricate parts of your creation. Help us to understand, uh, even though it seems like a small request, the difference between a micro predator and a parasite, knowing that that has implications as far as your design is concerned and uh, as far as um, what we need to think about in, in terms of what your creation was like before the fall. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand all of these things in, in such a way that uh, we can have educated discussions with people that need to hear about your love and your grace and, and have some questions or, or obstacles in their mind about how we can reconcile what scripture teaches with what we think we know from the world around us. But Father, help us also understand it in such a way that gives us a better appreciation for who you are as creator, designer. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're going to start off talking about lice, um, chewing and sucking lice. Chewing lice, there are a couple of different groups of, of, suck, of chewing lice, and then there's one, uh, I, I think these are suborder level, Anoplura of uh, sucking lice. And so both of them are in the order Theraptera, which is one of the coolest uh, names of an order with the PHTH, the th and then you get Theris, Theridae, you know, all kinds of wonderful modifications off of this. Um, and so lice... Lice are interesting. One uh, is, you know, lice have been an, an intimate uh, partner with humans for a long time. Uh, you can find uh, you can find lice from human remains, whether they're mummified uh, in ice or just dried out, or in mummified remains from some of the Egyptian kingdoms, and I mean, you basically, from anywhere on Earth where humans exist, you can find lice. And they're just, they're fantastic uh, little creatures. And because of that, you know, th this, this slide's kind of fun, gives you a number of different uh, illustrations of how lice are an integral part of our culture with all these wonderful sayings. He's a lousy teacher, which literally means, you know, has a very heavy lice infection. Uh, nitpicking. The idea of picking those eggs out of the hair, which is a painstaking process. Did you all hear that uh, Shannon Marcy's sister got lice? Do you all know Shannon Marcy? She's one of our, uh, one of our adjuncts, and she was about to, ready to go home for Thanksgiving break and took all of our cockroaches that we've been doing research on with her. So she called her mom to make sure that was okay, that she bring the cockroaches home. And she said, yeah, that's fine they can just spend time with your sister's lice that she's bringing home. Mom had to go pick her up from school at CBU and get her de-loused before they came home. So going over with a fine tooth comb, same idea, picking out the nits, getting down to the nitty gritty, uh, the nitty gritty dirt band, 1970s, a nitwit. That one's my favorite, nitwit. Somebody, you know, just full of a, a lice infection. Too stupid to even know they have lice. You know, uh, my brother got married in 2014, right after we all moved back from Ohio. And uh, we all went up to my brother's wedding, and my sister was there with my niece. And my niece is sitting there scratching her head right as my wife's, like, helping my sister-in-law, well, my sister-in-law now, get ready for the wedding, helping my sister, who was in the wedding, get ready and all this stuff. And they find lice, like a really heavy louse infestation in my niece's hair 
And uh, so now on top of trying to get everybody else ready for this wedding, they're de-lousing my niece. And uh, luckily she only spread it to one other person uh, at the wedding, but that could have been a really horrible, horrible wedding story. You know, your niece brings lice with a fairly heavy infestation and gives lice to literally everybody at the wedding. But luckily it was just one person, it was my cousin's kid, who was actually representing my cousin at the wedding. Uh, my cousin was happy she didn't come. All right, so let's talk about some of these specific groups. So here's Amblycera and Ishnocera are two, I'm, I'm pretty sure they are suborders uh, that represent chewing lice. And the reason why we separate chewing lice and sucking lice is there's a difference in how they feed. And it, it is exactly what it sounds like. Chewing lice rarely feed on blood. They usually feed on dead skin cells or on the hair or the feathers of their host. Whereas sucking lice feed primarily on blood uh, and do so by actually inserting their mouth parts into uh, the host. Now, both these uh, chewing lice and sucking lice tend to be pretty host specific. Uh, and that is, they, they tend to even not even go to closely related hosts. Uh, and, th and that's an interesting one because it's not an issue of, of um, it's, it's not an issue of like immune system not being adapted to survive the immune system. It's a different issue altogether. It's just they don't even recognize it as a food source. Sounding very much like predators, where predators are, you know, a good example of this. I don't know if any of you have been to the Midwest or into the South, but in the summertime, you get what are called cicada. We have them a little bit in the Southwest. You probably have them in New Mexico where you live, uh, where they're, they're insects that live, you know, most of the year underground as larvae and then emerge in the summertime to reproduce. On top of that, you have what are called periodic cicada that only emerge every 13 or 17 years. So they'll live 17 years underground as larvae and then emerge one summer every 17 years to reproduce. And they'll emerge at the same time that the species that emerge every year emerge. And a lot of times you can just get explosions in the number of cicada and have literally hundreds of millions of cicada blanketing everything. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, it's like a really loud, deep, penetrating vibration. You know, it's, did you watch the, uh, any of you watched the World Cup when it was in South Africa and they were using that, those musical instruments It just sounded like a bunch of bees? It's somewhat like that. I mean, it's just a, I'll, I'll, I'll put a video on for those of you that haven't experienced cicada. Um, but the periodic cicada, predators don't know what to do with them. There are animals that will eat cicada, but the, they don't know what to do with the periodic cicada because they're just not used to them. It's a very similar idea with this host specificity with these lice. Kind of tipping it in the idea of maybe considering these micro predators and not considering them parasites. Um, so this is an interesting one in that it, it has a, an intermediate host um, which, which, uh, so this, oh, sorry, this, uh, tick, or not tick, this louse, sorry, uh, Trichodectes canis actually serves as an intermediate host for a tapeworm parasite, Dipalidium caninum. And so the dogs, you know, have lice, they're chewing these lice to try to scratch them, and as they do, consume the larvae of this tapeworm parasite, and then finish off the life cycle. This is kind of fun. So uh, lice give us a good opportunity to talk about some different feeding strategies. You have what are called selenophagous uh, feeders. And these are those that actually insert their mouth parts into the bloodstream. And so usually they have their mouth pieces modified into a long piercing tube that they can insert directly into vessels and draw blood out. Versus telmophagus feeders, that they don't have the mouth parts to be able to insert their mouth part like a needle into the vessel. And so instead they cut up, they chew up the skin and get the blood to pool. From there they lap it up. 
And so of these, which of these do you think is the more dangerous feeding strategy with regards to the pathology of the host? So if you were somebody being chewed on, or maybe we should say being sucked on by these lice, uh, which would you prefer and why? To have them insert their mouth parts directly into your vessel, like almost like a needle, or to tear your flesh up to get the blood to pool. The first one, right? It's kind of like, which is a better way to donate blood? You know, to have something insert directly into a vessel or to just chew things up and try to get... Yeah, I mean, in terms of secondary infection, the telmophagus insects are a lot more dangerous because secondary infections are really common because they cause a lot of damage that your body has to work towards repairing. And a lot of opportunity for what you would call uh, opportunistic bacteria to take advantage, right? Big opening, opportunistic bacteria sneak in. All right, anapleura, the sucking lice. These are, I don't want to say more interesting, but these are maybe more familiar, the more familiar of our louse species. So you've got pediculus humanus or pediculus humanus. So these, um, there are two subspecies. There's pediculus humanus humanus, and then there's pediculus humanus capus. So two subspecies of the same species. And, we, and again, we say that these animals tend to be very host specific, and that's true of this species as well. And the subspecies are so specific that they only feed in specific areas on the body. I know that was a lot of time saying specific. But pediculus humanus capus is head lice. The lice that, how many of you have had lice in your life? None of you have had lice? Wow, that's awesome. I haven't either, but I want to. I actually, I just want to have lice. I want one of my kids to come home from school with lice because I want to collect the lice and I want to see if you can actually find evidence if a louse has fed on multiple people, I wanna see if you can tell that. If the blood has enough of the DNA left of the host that you can actually tell. Because I think it'd be really cool for people coming back from like mission strip on go teams to collect their lice and then to figure out where exactly they got it. To see if you can have enough blood from some of the people that the lice fed on before they fed on them to actually figure out exactly where they got it which region when they were there and try to figure out when they got it. You know, if they traveled around a lot during their trip, it's so much fun, so much fun. But Pediculus humanus capus, head lice. Pediculus humanus humanus, uh, those are body lice. Body lice and head lice, very different. Um, head lice, obviously with humans, there tends to be a lot of hair and so they will hide out in the hair. Body lice hide out in clothing. And so they will live in your clothing and then move on to your body to feed and then retreat back to your clothing. Because most people do not have enough body hair to provide a nice level of protection for these insects. Um, and so uh, body lice, you tend to only find uh, body lice being an issue uh, when during wartime when soldiers are in really tight quarters and can't change their outfits very often, and even when they happen across somebody who hasn't survived, will typically take their clothing to stay warm. And that tends to be the only time, or in, in, home, in homeless um, communities. And that's why this sometimes is referred to as vagabond's disease. And uh, those are tend to be the only time that you find body lice being an issue. And it's interesting, body lice, very dangerous. Uh, Pediculus humanus humanus carries a number of bacterial species that can cause some really devastating diseases. But Pediculus humanus capus does not. And so other than being annoying and pretty disgusting, uh, there's not a lot of danger about having head lice. Unless, of course, those lice feed off of somebody that's got some kind of a viral infection and can maybe spread that. So I think they've been able to do that in the lab, where they've been able to basically feed 
lice blood that had a virus in it and then successfully transmitted it to someone. But I don't know if they've ever been able to do it from like an infected individual to another, like allowed the lice to feed on a mouse that had a viral infection and then transmit it to another mouse. So I don't know if they've ever been able to do that. And I don't think anybody's ever found that it happens in the wild, but technically it's possible. So, which is kind of scary. So now head lice can become an issue if you have a bad enough infestation that the feeding uh, is so heavy that you get a secondary infection. And so this is uh, the, the plica polonica is usually a, a secondary infection um, that just basically turns everything into this big old mat um, where you've got a lot of lice feeding, a lot of you know, blood clots, a lot of coagulated blood, uh, bacterial infections, inflammation, lots of really interesting stuff. Theris pubis. Uh, this is pubic lice or the crab louse. And so this is a sexually transmitted disease, um, but really is not transmitted by bodily fluids. It's just transmitted by proximity. And so it's really transmitted the same way head lice or body lice is. Um, you can find these in areas other than the pubic region. They just need really coarse hair. So sometimes you'll find it in armpits, uh, in some others. Very rarely you'll find it in beards. Um, but yeah, it's transmitted the same way other louse species are, including by uh, contaminated bedding, contaminated linens. You, know, you can get body lice from putting on contaminated clothing you can get uh, crab lice or pubic lice uh, from contaminated linens. Uh, another species of sucking lice, Hematopinus suis. So you might be thinking, why on earth would we care about a pig louse? And I'm gonna present that question to you. Why would we care about a pig louse? Some of this information provided on the slide, but what are the things that make a parasite valuable? or important? Economic. Economic importance, right? It says other, after hog cholera, which is not a big deal in North America, so none of you have probably heard of it, but worldwide and in tropical regions, hog cholera kills a lot of pigs, but this is the most serious infection of swine. Causing irritation, weight loss, that's a huge issue if you are a pig farmer. Uh, anemia, again, another big issue if you are a pig farmer, economic losses, can be treated with insecticides to kill the lice or with ivermectin uh, to kill the lice. And uh, yeah, so this is an economically important parasite, one that we need to think about, be aware of uh, because of the economic losses. Look at that. Look at that parasite. And again, whether we call it a parasite or a micropredator, it's not always easy. Uh, and this is why we need you know, kind of some wisdom to think through this. So as you look at this organism, what does it look well adapted for doing? <laughs> They've got these big pinchers on the ends of all of their digits, right? And so when you see that happening on a crab, they're well adapted for grabbing onto things and either breaking it uh, or holding on to a material. These, these organisms are incredibly well adapted for holding on to fur, for holding on to hair, for staying put. Staying put in places uh, where they can then readily and easily feed. And so I want you to take a little bit, uh, talking with those around you, and I want you to come up with some ideas of how do you move from free living? So what are the transitions necessary to move from a free living insect to moving to feeding on a host, uh, you know, fur or feathers to moving to feeding on like host blood? What would be the steps necessary to make those transitions as you move from free living relying on basically yourself to find food to transitioning to doing something else. All right, take a couple of minutes, uh, think through that, and then we'll, we'll talk about it together.
nobody's even talking. Nobody's talking. Y'all just thinking about it? No ideas. It uh, reminds me of Big Hero 6. I don't know if you've seen that movie or not, but in Big Hero 6, uh, older brother is trying to inspire a younger brother to do something with his amazing intellect and trying to encourage him to get into uh, school and study robotics. And the younger kid is so frustrated that he's got nothing going on in his head. And he's just crumbling up paper after paper. And yeah, that kind of reminded me of that. Um, sorry. Um, and so what are some obstacles that a parasite living inside a host faces? What are some of those obstacles? What are the challenges of living inside of a host? Getting into the host, right? So you need some kind of a structure to penetrate the host, right? And that's one of the things that's listed as a, as a pre-adaptation for parasitism. Some way to penetrate host tissues. What else? Um, well, a challenge living in a host could be like the body Yeah, surviving the immune system. And so a lot of parasites have a way to regulate the immune response. And so they can do that indirectly by just basically changing their outer covering all the time, constantly changing what they present. So they're always unique to the immune system. The immune system can't get a grip on it. And some of them actually regulate the immune system. They turn off some sections, turn on others. Good, what are some other challenges? How do you get to the specific spot you need to be in, right? It's challenging, it's dark inside of a body. And you have to rely a lot on chemical cues and you have to overcome numerous and really heavy mechanical forces, you know, as you're traveling through uh, host tissues. Another big challenge is how do you get your offspring out of that host? You don't want to overwhelm the host, right? You don't want your offspring to basically infect the same host you are because that might overwhelm the host in which you and all your offspring would die. That's not good. That is not good. So you have to get your offspring out of the host. And that's a big challenge. And that's why increased reproductive output is considered to be a pre-adaptation for parasitism. Now think of these lice. Are these lice facing the challenge of having to penetrate host tissues? No, they are not, right? They're just having to live in the hair. Given a big enough organism, I could live in its hair, right? It's not challenging. I mean, it'd need to be a pretty big organism, um, but that's not super challenging. Do they face the challenge of having to overcome the host immune system? Not really, right? I mean, inflammation isn't really a big issue. Inflammation actually brings more blood to the area that's inflamed. That's wonderful if you're an external parasite that feeds on blood. You, you want inflammation. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, do they face the challenges of having to navigate their way through their host tissues? Not really. They just kind of crawl along the surface until they find a good place to feed on. Right? And do they face the challenge of having to get their offspring out? No, they're not inside, right? And a lot of these, some of them will feed. Some of them have larvae. Why they wouldn't consider them larvae. Some of them have offspring that also feed on that, the same individual. Some of them don't. It's really, you know, it's kind of up, up for how it works. Now, lice, the lice, even as larvae, feed in the same way the adults do, which is what can actually contribute to a really heavy infection if it's left untreated. And so these, you just admitted, do not face the same challenges as a parasite that lives inside of a host, right? 
So which do you think would be a, an easier transition? Transitioning from free living to being an endoparasite or transitioning from free living to being an ectoparasite? Ecto, right? You don't have a lot of those same challenges, meaning you don't have to have certain structures in place to overcome those challenges, right? So to make a shift from free living to feeding on another organism, all that really takes is being in the right place at the right time. And then what's interesting is then, well, how do you get from that to being very specific to where you only feed on that animal? That's where it gets a little bit interesting because that is a transition that needs to happen. And it basically comes with, you know, what do you recognize as food? And how do you actually get food? So these, look at this, look at this animal. Really well adapted for holding on, right? You see those claws? Really well adapted for holding on to its host fur. Does it look well adapted for running fast? Not really. And so it basically becomes, it becomes difficult for it to get food in other ways or to avoid predation, you know? Another way of being stuck in a host hair, if your host is big enough, it's not likely that you're gonna be preyed upon. All right, so lice as vectors of human disease. You know, we don't, we don't think too much about lice in terms of like the pathology of lice. It, it really is just bothersome. Like other than psychosomatic, which can be pretty intense. I don't know if you've ever had friends that got lice and then everybody in their house got lice and people just start going almost psychotic to try to eradicate the house for lice. And one person stops having lice and then you think you've rid your house of it. And two days later, somebody else shows up with lice. If any of you had any friends that that was your experience? <laughs> this is brother-in-law and sister-in-law. I tried to get them to mail me their lice when we were living in Ohio. And they wouldn't do it. They said it's illegal, which it is, but they wouldn't do it, which was a shame. And so I mentioned this before, but head lice have very little potential to cause some devastating pathologies. Body lice, different story. And so here are three different bacterial symbionts, if you will, that live inside of the lice that can be transmitted by body lice. And so there are the diseases. You have what's called epidemic, louse-borne typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. All of these are epidemic, which means that they spread quickly and they can kill a lot of people. And what you tend to find again, I, I mentioned this, that the, the times in which body lice really become a problem is during major war time, where people just are stuck in the same place for long periods of time. Trench warfare basically didn't exist prior to World War I, and then in World War I, for years, some soldiers never moved more than 10 or 15 feet for years at a time. Because it would become very difficult to move them out and to get them the leave that they were supposed to have. And so some people basically stayed put and didn't move very much for years at a time. And so a lot of these lice, louse-born diseases uh, became really common and actually killed uh, just as many, if not more, people than the actual warfare. All right, any questions about lice? Cool. Hannah, you have any ideas for leading your discussion on Wednesday? Oh, okay. What I mean, now it's All right, so we have this order of insects called Hemiptera. And these are the only insects that are actually bugs. And so the term bug means something very specific to an entomologist or a parasitologist that it does not mean to the normal person, right? We tend to use the term bug to refer to anything, right? Something infecting your computer, oftentimes we call it a bug, right? 
something giving you the cold or a flu, oftentimes referred to those bugs. Basically, everybody refers to almost any insect, spider, centipede, millipede, scorpion, anything they don't like as a bug, right? So they probably have a specific meaning for bug as well, and it's just anything unpleasurable, right? Uh, but to an entomologist or a parasitologist, bug has a very specific meaning, and it means that it's a member of this order, Hemiptera. And so I want to give you some examples of this. The first one, family Simicidae, genus Cymex, bedbugs. So these are selen selenophagous insects, which means what? So we presented two feeding strategies, selenophagy and talmophagy. One of them was inserting the mouth parts directly into the vessels. One of them was basically serrating the vessels and getting blood to pool, which is this. Yeah, inserting mouth parts directly into the vessels. And so these are, these tend to be less species specific than lice do. And so bed bugs will, will tend to feed on multiple different things. Basically anything that will sleep in your bed that's infested with bed bugs, they'll feed on. Not anything, but just about anything. And bed bugs are interesting in that, you know, they, they feed and move away and feed and move away and feed and move away. And I think are very obviously micro predators and not parasites. Okay? They're just not eating all of you, right? They're just eating little pieces of you at a time. Given enough time, they could kill you. But man, it would take a long time and a whole bunch of them. And a lot of other extenuating factors. And so here is a zoomed in picture of a bed bug feeding. You can see the selenophagus feeding strategy with its mouth part directly inserted like a needle. And then the picture on the right, the feces of the bed bugs. And so as they feed on blood, one of their metabolic byproducts is, um, is an iron rich material with the leftover hemoglobin. And so their feces is really dark and red and looks like blood stains, but little teeny tiny pools of blood stains. And there on the bottom is a zoomed up image of a whole bunch of little bed bugs hiding out under a mattress. It's a wonderful, wonderful image. So while I was at another institution, I won't tell you which one it was, there was a, uh, a bed bug epidemic, if you will. It started in one dorm when one person probably brought it back from home or wherever they went, maybe it was on a vacation, they weren't actually at home. And then it very quickly spread to several dorms that they ended up having to move people out of those dorms entirely under very controlled you know, formats to get them out and then not move them to other dorms and then just bomb the dorms and get them to die. It's, it's pretty challenging to get all of the bed bugs because they are attracted by heat. And that's how they know you're laying in bed. They can sense the increase in temperature. And so to get them out of the crevices so that the toxins in the bombs can get to them, you actually have to heat it up. And so you have to jack the heater up in all those buildings, get it really hot in there so that they'll come out of their hiding places and your, your noxious fumes can get to them. It's kind of fun. All right, so that's one true bug, Hemiptera, Simicidae, Reduvidae, or redu, Reduvidae. I say Reduvidae, but I've heard other people say Reduvidae, um, and specifically under that family, Triatomini. These are the assassin bugs. These are, again, an obvious micro predator and not a parasite. So they're called assassin bugs or kissing bugs uh, because they oftentimes bite the lip of the host. And so they aren't just attracted to heat, but they're attracted to carbon dioxide. So the reason they're attracted to your mouth is when you're sleeping, that's where the carbon dioxide is leaving. And so they'll come and they'll feed, uh, and they feed on blood. They are selenophagous, like bed bugs. Insert their mouth parts directly into your vessels. And as they do, they oftentimes uh, donate, if you will, one of their parasites, Trypanosoma cruzi. If you remember back to a few, probably a couple of months ago now, 
Uh, this is the causative agent of Chagas disease. And the biggest reason why Chagas disease is not an issue, as much an issue in the United States as it is in Central and South America, is not because we don't have, you know, um, we don't have kind of the same issues. It's just, it's hard for this insect to hide out. Although you do find it, you do find some of these insects with Trypanosoma cruzi in North America, but not in high numbers. Because it's just harder for them to hide out. They're quite a bit bigger than bed bugs. Uh, and so it's a little bit harder for them to find a place. They love thatched roofs. And so in areas where you have a lot of thatched roofs, um, it's a great place for these insects. All right, that's it for the true bugs. So now that you are informed of what bug actually means to an entomologist or to a parasitologist, I don't want to ever hear you say bug in reference to another insect, especially ladybugs. They are not bugs, they are beetles. Okay? And I don't even let my children call them ladybugs. I correct them every time to lady beetles. And the original common name was actually a ladybird, which I have no idea what that means, but is preferable over ladybug. Because bird, I don't know why, but bug has a very specific meaning to an entomologist. All right, now fleas, everybody's favorite insect micropredator. And I think all of these so far, lice, a little bit differently. So lice, at least head lice and pubic lice, a little bit less clearly micropredators, but body lice and bed bugs and um, assassin or kissing bugs, I think more obviously micropredators. Fleas, I, I think are pretty obviously uh, micropredators as well. This is a fun statement. Well, I don't know what this effect was. That was pretty obnoxious. So Lehane in 1969 made this statement. The combined effects of Nero and Kublai Khan, of Napoleon and Hitler, all the popes, all the pharaohs, and all the incumbents of the Ottoman throne are as a puff of smoke against the typhoon blast of fleas ravages through the ages. And that's primarily based on one bacterium spread by fleas. Do you know what it is? Those of you that have taken world history and have read about the plague, the cause of agent of the plague, which is spread by fleas, Yersinia pestis. Yersinia pestis. We'll, we'll get there. Big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and little fleas have lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. Swift. It's 1733. Just some fun ideas of fleas. So some interesting things about fleas, they can be selenophagus or telmophagus like lice can. Um, now these, these insects, they have complete metamorphosis. So lice do not. Lice have incomplete metamorphosis where the offspring look pretty much like adults but are just sexually immature. Fleas have a complete metamorphosis. Their larvae look nothing like the adults and live in a completely different place. And so fleas have to jump onto their host once they reach adulthood. And because of this, fleas are incredible jumpers. And then we're, we're going to actually watch a video. So I want to watch a couple videos. Um, but we'll watch a video of fleas jumping, doing some pretty incredible uh, stuff. Can jump 100 times their body weight. And so, yeah, again, larvae usually develop off the host and are non-parasitic. And uh, so these, again, have a complete metamorphosis uh, with different conditions. So different categories. We tend to separate uh, fleas based on their host. So some rodent fleas, seldom on the host. Uh, but feed as the rodents go back to their nest. Uh, most fleas, though, and again, we, we tend to refer to these by their host, so we'll call it human fleas, we'll put dog fleas, cat fleas. Um, but most fleas spend most of their time on the host and then just move off. The females will move off to lay their eggs um, and, and to move from there. But there are some fleas that are called stick-tight fleas that attach permanently to their host. And then there are chiggers or chigos that burrow underneath the skin uh, and are 
obviously parasites and not micro predators. And so here is the human flea, Pulex irritans. This is not the flea that spread Yersinia pestis, uh, the flea that contributed to plague, Mo more than likely. Um, and what we mean by the human flea is just when humans get fleas, this is the most likely um, species. Then you have Tenocephalides canis or Tenocephalides felis, uh, the dog and cat flea. And again, we tend to name fleas based on their host. Look at some of these features that allow you to tell one species from another are these what are called tenidia, C-T-E-N-I-D-I-A, these tenidia, these bristles that come off of the head. And so you can tend to, you know, separate one species from another by the structure and placement of those. Here is the uh, flea that was most likely responsible for the plague, the two plagues in Europe that combined to kill, you know, a large percentage, a third to a half of Europe's entire population. Xenopsila chiopis, or Xenopsila chiopis, the oriental rat flea. And so, yeah, it carries Yersinia pestis and uh, can have a number of issues. Uh, tunga penetrance, this is the chigger or chigo or jigger. Uh, this is a flea that burrows into the skin and will love to stay there as long as you'll let it. Taking on the role of a parasite versus a micro predator. And so uh, this is uh, an idea uh, from 1 Samuel. Then they said, what shall be the guilt offering? which we should return to him. And they said, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on all of you and on all your lords. And so this is the idea that the plague that had two, uh, bubonic plague, uh, that had two outbreaks in Europe, um, that it actually was mentioned is the plague referred to in this instance because of the reference to tumors, which bubonic plague is called that because of the presence of buboes, swollen lymph, lymph nodes uh, that look like tumors, and then also the reference to rodents that are carriers for the fleas that bring Yersinia pestis. So Yersinia pestis, Black Death, killed 25 million in the 14th century. There was another one in, I think, the 12th uh, century that wasn't quite uh, as, as devastating. Killed five and a half million people in the late uh, in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century in India. Uh, you find you know a handful of cases every year in the United States, usually associated with wild rodents, mostly ground squirrels. And so you've got the different forms of the plague: bubonic, where you've got buboes, the swollen nymph nodes; pneumonic, where the lungs. Uh, it's spread into your lungs and then septicemic where you've got a blood infection that's virtually 100% uh, fatal. So in California, 1992, there were 13 uh, cases of bubonic plague um, and 12 or 13 people that died from bubonic plague and 12 of them were after it spread to the pneumonic phase. So some more diseases spread by fleas. Murin typhus, epidemic of flea-borne typhus, spread by a rickettsia. Same vector, Synopsila chiopis. And so this is why we refer to fleas as some of the most devastating uh, creatures. Some of the most devastating insects. Other than Mosquitoes and flies, these are the most devastating uh, insects. And so here are some parasites that are also spread by other fleas. So this is Trypanosoma lewisi uh, and Dipalidium caninum. We talked about that, a, a tapeworm. Hymenolepis diminuta, another tapeworm spread by fleas. Hymenolepis nana, another tapeworm that can be spread by fleas. Uh, Dipetalomena reconditum, and I'm not, I don't remember what that parasite is. 
And so the way we treat these is we tend to uh, use, use pesticides, insecticides, uh, to treat areas that are really high, where flea prevalence is really high. Uh, we tend to use heavy amounts of pesticides and insecticides. All right, yellow-green filters attract the adults. It's interesting, attracting them with color. So I want to show you a couple of videos and, and talk about these in a little bit more detail, and then I think we'll leave the rest of our insect groups for Wednesday uh, before uh, Hannah leads our discussion. So let's do this. Training fleas requires a glass jar with a lid. The fleas are placed inside the jar and the lid is then sealed. They are left undisturbed for three days. Then, when the jar is opened, the fleas will not jump out. In fact, the fleas will never jump higher than the level set by the lid. Their behavior is now set for the rest of their lives. And when these fleas reproduce, their offspring will automatically. It says when they reproduce, their offspring will automatically jump at that height, which isn't true. Uh, but it is true that you can train them pretty easily. Put together your own little flea circus. Hey, 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 don't want that. This one's a fun video too. Hey! Oh! 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 RAV4 Adventure Grade, the quickest way to adventure. 44 years after the debate about how fleas jump began, Cambridge researchers say they've solved the mystery thanks to high-speed cameras that show the insects pushing off with their toes rather than with their knees. It was back in 1967 that scientists discovered that the flea stores the energy needed to catapult itself in an elastic pad made of resolin. But the flea film industry was still in its infancy and movies weren't sharp enough to show just how the insect did it. So no one knew exactly how the fleas harnessed this explosive energy. John one researcher, frogs, Henry Bennett Clark, hypothesized that, that it was so all in the bug's frogs. toes. But another, Miriam Rothschild, believed it was in the fleas' knee. Check that out. Only by analyzing right these new high-speed movies can the dispute swapped. finally be laid to rest. The research team found that fleas transmit their stored energy through leg segments that act as levers, pushing down on the toe to launch the tiny animals up to 13 inches, or 200 times their own body length. Team Bennett Clark for the win. Go here to read the full Discovery News story. For Discovery News, I'm Jorge Rito. Ooh. It basically loads it up, uh, locks it in place, like triggered, ready to fire, and then snaps that, that joint open and just launches itself. It's fantastic. Fantastic. I wanted to show you something else. The new 
Dickey's Flex Series is built for performance. With some... The worst case of head lice caught on camera. It's a parent's worst nightmare, and the reason I refuse to have children. Head lice. This video has grossed out more than 4 million people since it was uploaded to YouTube. It shows one of the worst cases of head lice in modern history, in disturbing high definition. Head lice are tiny little bugs that love, love, love your head. Anyone can get head lice, and it's an allergic reaction that causes one's scalp to itch. Keep in mind that itchiness sometimes doesn't develop for up to three months. Head lice live for around 30 days, feeding on the blood of their host. Females lay about six eggs a day. They cement the egg called a knit to the hair shaft, usually within an inch of the scalp. Each knit contains a single louse embryo, and each female louse can lay upwards of 150 knits in her lifetime. Head lice have been a problem for humans since, well, forever. But this particular case of head lice seems to be <clears throat> ahead of the others on the grossometer scale. I mean, look at those creepy, crawling, contagious, blood-sucking parasites. Did you itch your head while watching this? Share this video if you did. You got head lice, don't you? Isn't that fun? When you were a kid, your parents might have told you not to let the bed bugs bite. And for a long time, they were so unheard of that you might have asked your parents what a bed bug even was. But today, bed bugs are the fastest growing pest control emergency in the developed world. One in five Americans either has had bed bugs or knows someone who has. And the problem isn't going away. It's actually getting a lot worse. Known in the scientific world as Cymex lectularius, bed bugs are blood feeding insects that are about the size of an apple seed once they're fully grown. They survive on the blood of mammals and insects, but they prefer human blood. A colony of bed bugs can have thousands of individuals and you can have them without even knowing it. So here's what you need to know about bed bugs. The name bed bug might make you think they only live in beds, but bed bugs will live just about any where they can hide. An adult bed bug is five millimeters long and as narrow as a piece of paper, and they can crawl up to 30 meters in a night to find a meal. That means bed bugs will hide behind light switches on the wall, underneath peeling paint and wallpaper, or in the gap between walls and the baseboards or just about anywhere else. Bed bugs have even been found living inside a prosthetic leg. We've been dealing with bed bugs for a really long time. We know they infested ancient Rome. The Romans actually brewed them and drank them as a cure for snake bites, which I'm sure was delicious. We also know they were in ancient Egypt because the Egyptians wrote about them, probably complaining to their landlords. In fact, archeological evidence tells us that bed bugs have fed on humans for at least 3,500 years because fossilized bed bugs have been found at dig sites. But bed bugs may have been plaguing us for much longer than that based on what's in their mitochondrial DNA. DNA, that is, the DNA inside the powerhouse of the cell. By comparing the mitochondrial markers in bed bug Morning. populations around the world, we've learned that they originated in caves in the Middle East, where they would have fed on bats. Now, bed bugs can't fly, and... Growing Texas health officials say kissing bugs have infected at least 12 people with a parasite that has the potential to kill. I've never left the United States. I've uh, never even been on a cruise. So it had to be here. I was infected right here in Texas. That comment should draw attention. Kissing bugs and the parasite they carry are usually only found in the tropics. Kissing bugs got their interesting nickname because they favor biting human faces and lips at night. And the parasite they leave behind causes Chagas disease. The disease has an acute phase, much like the flu to start, before it transitions into a chronic phase, during which up to 30% of people develop heart problems and 10% develop gastrointestinal issues. And in rare cases, Chagas disease can end in death. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates 8 million people in Mexico and Central and South America are infected with Chagas disease, yet most don't even know it. There's no approved treatment for the disease. The CDC only has experimental drugs, which Boring. reportedly can be up to 85% effective, but they have to be taken soon after a person. Should have triggered specific videos uh, to get it ready for that. And so the flea, the flea videos I've seen before in that last video I've seen before. Um, but as you think through some of these insect groups or you prepare for leading a discussion on Wednesday, uh, one thing I want to remind you 
is uh, one, we're probably dealing with mostly micro predators and not actual parasites. And the reason why that's important uh, is because micro predators are technically free living organisms. Okay? They're free living organisms that feed, they just feed on something way bigger than themselves. And so that gives us sort of some different issues uh, than organisms that are clearly symbiotic. Because organisms that are clearly symbiotic have some big challenges and have some things that they need to have in place in order to have that kind of an existence and really cause you to question why on earth would something be designed that would function this way? Whereas micro predators, I think it's very easy to assume that they began their existence free living and from there moved into a predatory relationship with humans. All right. So we're going to stop here because I don't want to get into some other insect groups. I want to save some material for our discussion on Wednesday. And then uh, Hannah, Hannah will lead our discussion on Wednesday. And